Um, so today I'll talk about a new ex vivo human skin model that we've been using to study dermonecrosis. So just this one. So everyone in this room is pretty familiar that snake bite is a major public health issue. Um, but in addition to mortality, so we've seen a lot of information about systemic envenomation, but there's also four times as much morbidity. Dermonecrosis is one of the leading causes of snake bite morbidity, um, and this results in amputations and um, tissue destruction that immediately takes effect. And that is one of the problems is there's usually a delay in treatment. And so we're already dealing with the symptoms um, of dermonecrosis. Unfortunately, antivenoms aren't very effective at this, um, at neutralizing these effects, um, because they have poor tissue distribution into the areas that are experiencing the tissue destruction. And so cytotoxicity is um, a critical concern with snake bite, and there's a critical need to better understand venom cyto cytotoxicity and evaluate novel treatments um, for dealing with dermonecrosis. Currently, we use a mouse model to study um, dermonecrosis, and this is the MND model, so the minimum necrotizing dose, and it's actually primarily used to evaluate treatments because the dose is determined, um, the venom dose is determined that results in five millimeter lesions um, and within 72 hours. And so we use this as a standard to then evaluate a treatment uh, therapeutic application. But today I'm gonna to talk about another model that we've been working with um, at CSRI, and this is the ex vivo human skin model. And so this came from a company, Genoskin. And so this is actually received from donors that have undergone abdominal plasty. And it's a skin biopsy. Um, and we were able to then do perform interdermal venom injections into the skin biopsy to study the effects of the venom. And one nice thing about this model is number one, it's, it's quite ethical as you no know, mice are involved and it can even go even longer than our MND models from mice. So we've been able to take this up to seven days and we see no effects of the skin, um, no effects of it, you know, uh, undergoing any changes besides that of the venom. Up to seven days, we've evaluated it. And another nice aspect of this model is it's more relevant to snake bite, especially given that this is human skin uh, versus mouse skin. And there are many differences between mice and human skin. For one, mice skin um, is a lot thinner. Um, there's also more hair follicles. And then there's also differences in immune gene development, activation and response for mice. And so really studying the inflammation processes in a human, um, it's best in this ex vivo human skin model. So what we did is we looked at several different venoms from Africa, um, venomous snakes from Africa um, that are responsible for necrosis. Um, so they, we covered both vipers and elapids. So for vipers, we have uh, Echis species, uh, Bittus, and then we had um, Nagel nigricolis for our necrotic spitting cobra. And then we had a control that Anaja Haji, which is the Egyptian cobra, that's not known to result in dermonecrosis. So we also use this in the model as well. Um, because this was the first time we really worked with this model, we initially started with the MND values that were determined for mice to get an idea of the lesions. And actually, interestingly enough, we did not see lesions at this dose, and we ended up having to increase it to three times the MND. Um, and even with that, the lesions were um, very faint and not very visible. Um, but most notably for the, the puff adder, we were able to see some brownish um, detections of lesions. Of course, too, because we evaluated this with the MND, it is difficult to say that the puff adder resulted in more dermonecrosis um, just because we did use a greater amount of venom because once again, we based it initially on those MND values for our evaluation. So although there wasn't very apparent lesions, they were quite faint. Um, when we performed histology, we actually did see um, with h &E staining uh, differences in, well, we actually began to see um, separation of the epidermis and dermis, um, especially with the viper venoms, with the echis and vitis on the top. And 
Then also of note is we did see um, presence of apoptotic or necrotic cells for our control, Naja Haji, which is not really known, which is we don't really see dermal necrosis um, in, in the clinic with, with this particular cobra. So it's quite interesting that we were still seeing apoptotic cells um, with this venom. Just to confirm this, we did um, immunofluorescent labeling um, to detect apoptosis. And so this was done with an anti-active caspase three and with tunnel. And so this confirmed the presence of um, apoptosis. And then in fact, necrosis, you could say in some regions, since you have whole patches of cells. Um, so you see with the yellow arrows, whole patches of cells um, that are detecting of um, cell death. Once again, with, we saw the, the greatest extent of damage on apoptosis with bitis irritans, the puff adder venom. But interestingly, as I mentioned with the previous slides, um, with H&E staining, we also saw uh, presence of apoptotic cells with Naja Haje as well, deep down in the dermis. Um, and so this is uh, my main contribution to the project. Um, so I specialize in RNA sequencing. And so we are really interested in um, evaluating what changes are happening um, in the human skin and especially in comparison to the mouse models. Because um, I as I mentioned, it is quite interesting that uh, you have different genes between the mouse and the human skin. And RNA-seq is an unbiased approach to evaluate these pro-inflammatory markers as opposed to um, like Luminex cytokine panel where you're just going to get res uh, results from a general inflammatory panel. In addition to inflammation, um, we were able to also see genes responsible for wound healing and coagulation, because um, we, especially in the case of the mouse models, uh, we performed RNA-seq with both the mouse lesions and the human lesions um, from the biopsies. And so we actually did have some, um, the blood con contamination in there as well. And so for this, just for reference, these reads were mapped to the human genome or mouse genome and G-fold used to determine the fold change um, between the venom and treated and untreated conditions. So at 48 hours, um, I just looked at the top 50 upregulated genes. Um, well, I mentioned, well, I looked at it for both the 24 and 48 hour mark. But the 24, we actually didn't really see any shared overlap. We were primarily looking at the venoms that were responsible for necrosis. So the two viper species and Naja nigricolis, the spitting cobra. And this is probably likely due to there wasn't as many uh, genes that were upregulated with Naja nigricolis. In fact, that biopsies were in some cases unremarkable. So that could be maybe the venom doses um, that were required to really see the dermal necrosis. We weren't quite reaching yet. Um, and in fact, it was kind of patchy. So um, maybe that kind of relates to the skip lesions that you, you see actually in the clinic. Um, but there weren't as many shared genes. But by 48 hours, we did see um, a response for all of the skin biopsies. And we saw shared genes um, that were common. Um, in fact, even common to the Najahaje, the control that isn't responsible for necrosis, but it was still producing chemokines, uh, especially chemokine ligand 5, which is neutrophil recruiting um, that was seen for all four venoms. And then for the necrotic um, venoms, which is two vipers and the spitting cobra, um, we also saw seven or I'm sorry, we also saw three common genes. And so many of these are responsible for inflammation, um, also probably beginning the process of repair. And then even um, endogenous inhibitors of metalloproteases are even, we saw it being produced um, to probably counter the effects of the metalloproteases in the venom. So other noted, um, biomarkers we saw is especially for the echis venom. We saw, well, actually for all of the venoms, um, we saw many of these damage associated molecular pattern molecules. And these primarily were S100 proteins. And so, so these have even been found in snake bite blister fluid. Um, so it was pretty exciting to see these results in here as well for our human biopsies. Um, so we found that the skin tissues, um, in particular keratinocytes, uh, we believe we've actually uh, determined that with cell cultures of just keratinocytes are producing these S100 proteins in response. And in the case of the bitis um, venom injected skin biopsies, we saw a greater number of keratin genes. So definitely more um, healing processes are in place with this venom. But also overall, we saw more damage um, in the case of the, the bitis venom. <clears throat> 
So also we did comparisons to the mouse MND. Um, and so these were not the same dose. This was actually stayed consistent with their MND models um, using those doses. Um, I took skin lesions or actually um, a, a team of us took skin lesions and we performed the RNA sequencing. And so we begin to see some differences between the mouse model though and the human model being that the mouse model um, has um, circulation. And so we saw more of uh, plasma proteins that were present um, in or expression of different plasma proteins in the RNA-seq from uh, the mouse, especially in the case of the ECUS, um, because uh, there's just a lot of bleeding present um, for those particular treatments. And a greater number of epidermal repair genes were upregulated for the puff adder, um, including unique S116A, um, which is known to generate matrix producing fibroblasts. So once again, a lot of repair that's happening with the, the puff adder venom. And as I mentioned, the S1, in particular the S100 genes, there are different isoforms between the mouse and human. Um, so it was quite interesting to see that S100A9 was consistently upregulated for both the mouse and the human models for both of the, these viper venoms. Um, and and also S100A8 as well, but not this wasn't the case for all of the S100s. Um, and you can also see differences in the, in particular, the chemokines. So we just selected of these top 50 for each condition uh, to look at the particular ones that would be involved in um, inflammation or a damp. Our last thing is we wanted to look at anti-venom interventions to see if our model could be used to study that. It's quite diff difficult because anti-venom is administered through IV, so we did have to do interdermal injections of the anti-venom. But what we did is after the venom treatments, an hour following, we performed interdermal injections of the anti-venom. And then 48 hours following that, um, we also performed RNA sequencing um, and histology as well. And as what's commonly seen even in clinics, um, even with the administration of antivenom, the damage has already been done. So even after an hour, um, we were already seeing the damage um, to the tissue layers. Um, but one thing that was interesting is the RNA-seq supported and also um, the Luminex cytokine panel supported that there was a de decrease in expression of pro-inflammatory genes um, after treatment with the antivenom. So those samples at 48 hours, um, there was less inflammation, at least gene markers for that. And so this could be a potential model in the future as new therapies are developing as we've been hearing about these past couple of days. Um, it could be a model to evaluate some of these therapies, especially for local envenoming, um, because this is quite a serious matter um, because this is primarily responsible for the amputations and the dermal necrosis and the long-term effects of snake bite. So just to summarize, we did have to use an increased dose um, for MNDs. Um, for the skin model, we had to use increased dose of what we saw for the mouse MNDs. We also, our non-necrotic venom actually turned out to exhibit some signs um, of apoptosis. We saw some similarities between the mouse and humans, especially the S100 A9 genes, um, but there were also differences between the S100 isoforms and differences in expression between these two models. And other considerations uh, is that uh, are that uh, there are different, obviously different cells between um, the mouse and the human. As I mentioned, more higher follicles for the mouse and different genes that are present. And also uh, the mouse model has circulation as opposed we didn't have that with the, uh, the biopsy. Um, and as I mentioned, once again, this could be a very interesting model to use to evaluate new snake bite therapeutics. So I'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone that helped with this project. So a lot of this was led by uh, Jaffer, a previous PhD student at LSTM, and then the pathology was done by Gail Lemming. Um, and then we also have a large in vivo team um, at LSTM that I would like to thank for supplying me with skin lesions for my sequencing. <laughs>